I want to talk a little bit today um, about some of the greatest running moments in history. Are there any runners in the house? We're such a fit church at Passion City Church. I know you're still in that, I'm coming out of COVID one of these days, and when I do, I'm going to get back in shape. Anybody's in that zone? And when this is over, I'm going to start getting back in shape. But there is a runner. He didn't want to admit it, but his friends pointed. Are you a runner? Does that mean that you're a runner? Somebody was pointing your way. No, you're looking confused. Okay, I'll just leave all that. Let y'all work that out afterwards. Um, anybody run a marathon in the house? Okay, a, a few people up here. These are the uh, serious people. Oh, oh, I see Bryson over there. 26.2 miles. People do this. They choose to do this. Most of us don't like driving 26.2 miles, but people choose to do this. So there was an experiment that happened a few years ago, blew my mind hearing about it. And the experiment was, can a human being run a marathon in under two hours? Now, some of you who said you had run a marathon, you were like, yeah, I did mine, but it was six hours and 18 minutes, or uh, I did it over three days, or you know, you know, different times. But can a human being run a marathon in under two hours? And so they set up a marathon race in Vienna, Austria, and this legendary marathoner, he's the greatest marathon runner alive right now, a Kenyan named Elihud Kipchoge. He set out to run a sub two hour marathon and he did it. He finished the marathon in one hour, 59 minutes and 40 seconds, meaning he ran four minute, 35 second miles for 26.2 miles. But it didn't count because it wasn't an open race. It was a specifically designed race just for Kipchoge. There were hundreds of thousands of people in the course. It all looked legit and official, but they designed it to be an extremely flat course with very few twists and turns. They hired a group of elite runners who surrounded him the entire race. They broke the headwind so he could run in their draft. He didn't even have to drift over to the drink table at the eight mile mark to grab a cup of water. Someone came alongside on a motorcycle and handed him his nourishment through the race. But with an amazing team and the sophistication of a computer which had re-engineered the time to break the two hour mark, his elite running core knew they needed to keep their feet on the green line the entire time. But nonetheless, he did it and he ran the sub two hour marathon, even though it didn't count. But I don't want you to feel sorry for Mr. Kipchoge today because he is a boss and he currently holds the world record in the marathon in an oh so slow time of two hours, one minute and 39 seconds. He holds the current world marathon record. I would have clapped right there, but <laughs> apparently we're feeling more conviction than we need to right now. Okay, so not too many marathoners. Anybody ever run a mile? Okay, now, okay, we're all getting involved now. So in 1954, a big event happened in running. We're talking about big running events today. And that moment happened in Oxford, England, when Roger Bannister broke the four minute mark in the mile. This was something that people thought a human being would never do. And finally, Roger Bannister does it, and he does it just barely. He runs the mile in three minutes, 59.4 seconds. He only holds that record for a moment, but I was like, who holds that record now? So did a little research and found out that a Moroccan runner currently holds the mile record, Hashem Garoju, and he's held this record 
since 1999. I'm like, no records last since 1999. Three minutes, 43.13 seconds, he ran the mile. But then I thought, well, we're talking about great running events. I want to keep going. So I looked up the Easter morning 1,000 meter race. It happened in 30 AD in the city of Jerusalem. And when the news of the empty tomb had reached back to the disciples who were still holed up in the doubt of Saturday, a race broke out toward the garden. And we read about it in John chapter 20, because the news we're talking about today is good enough news to send people running. Today is not about hands in your pocket, stand around the water cooler, oh, that's a great idea kind of news. Today is, did anybody grow up in a church where somebody occasionally took a lap? Anybody come from a background like that? Anyone? This is that kind of news. So I'm not suggesting that you need to take a lap. We're still in COVID protocol and people don't want you wheezing and coughing around uh, their area. But this is that kind of news. Easter is the kind of day that sets people in motion. It's the kind of day that gets people excited. It's the kind of news that makes you want to run. And And on the very first day, people started running. John 20, it says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So what are the next words? She came what? She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John, who's writing this, who's giving himself a pat on the back. And she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. But notice how they started for the tomb. They didn't say, wow, when I finish breakfast, I think I'll check that out. Or, um, you know, when it gets a little bit warmer, I think we should go. Or, I don't know, what do you think? You want to go or not? Immediately, it says, they both were running. They entered the Easter morning 1,000 meter race, which is about how far it is from where the disciples would have been holed up to the place where Jesus was sealed in a tomb. And they're not running on a track. They're not running down a road with people breaking headwind. They're running through the streets and the alleys of Jerusalem, taking turns and twists and down this road and around that little cart and Through this little alleyway, they're running. And John wants us to know how the race played out. He he doesn't just want to know that there are marathon winners and mile winners. He wants us to know who won this day. And so he explains it this way. Both were running, but the other disciple himself outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived in second place and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. You got two guys in a sprint to an empty tomb. But do you know what's amazing about it? When they got there, Jesus was already alive and the work was already done. They ran as fast as they could, but when they got there, God had already moved first. They back and forth, tug of war, 
John at the end kicking in the afterburners, maybe taking a shortcut through another alley that Simon Peter didn't know about. He arrives first. I win the race. He came in second. I came in first. But the big story is it doesn't matter which one of them got there first. When they got there, the angel who had moved the stone was sitting there smiling and waiting for them to arrive. And Jesus is just walking around in the garden, already conquering death, hell, and the grave. The story of Easter isn't about how fast you need to run to get to the tomb. The story is whenever you get there, God's already going to be there ahead of you, and he is going to have finished all of the work before you arrive, because today's not about a marathon record. It's not about a mile record. It's not about who won the Easter morning 1,000 meter race. Today is about the reality that God Almighty himself is the first mover in your story. I am so glad that we did not come to church today to preach a message of what we all need to do to get to God. But our message today is God is the first mover in your story. In other words, before you even knew you needed an empty tomb, the stone was rolled away. And before you ever even thought to yourself, this isn't working. And I need a savior. God had already done the most remarkable running that has ever been done. Jesus told us about it in Luke chapter 15 as he's unfolding the, the stories of stories. No one will ever write any stories that eclipse these three stories that Jesus cobbles together of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. If I said prodigal son, all of us church people would know it. But if I said prodigal son, even if you came as a guest of a friend today, you would know it. This son who says to his dad, I know I've got an inheritance coming, but I want it right now. And he gets his share and bolts, it says, for a far country. And we don't know exactly what went down there. We get the older brother's take on the story, but I don't know, maybe he just lived too fast, spent the money too carelessly. But we do know he went broke. We do know his friends bailed on him. And we do know that he lost it all. And we know that at some point in the story, he realized what I'm doing here is not working. And it says in verse 20 of Luke 15 that that boy decided to make a change. Remember, you can do that today. And I don't know, maybe somebody has done that today. I, okay, some people are doing that today. That's pretty phenomenal. It says, so, verse 20, he, the son, got up and went to his father. Now, we have a... A lot of ways we've, we have interpreted this, and I've probably preached this text uh, hundreds of times in my lifetime. I was preaching it that night that that first college student girl got up and walked that long arena in Oxford, Mississippi. And we've always preached, you know, the son, he got it. He repented. He got up and he turned around. That's the word repentance. And he went home. But I've been digging in this text a lot lately, and when I dug in the text, I realized his speech was, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. Those words weren't his words. Those words were Pharaoh's words quoted in the Old Testament that he said to Moses when he wanted the plagues to be lifted. And he said, I've sinned, Pharaoh, against heaven and against you. Please take this plague away. But it wasn't that Pharaoh was repenting. It was that he was trying to work out a deal where he could alleviate the situation. And so the son most likely was thinking, I've got to repay pay my dad. 
And I'm not making a penny here. In fact, I'm so far down, I'm eating what the pigs are eating. And the only way I can see paying back my dad is getting a job as one of my dad's hired servants. Because actually, my dad is a very fair and generous man, and they get paid a very fair and generous wage. And if I can just get on with them, I will work my way to save up enough to pay back my dad. That's probably what the boy was thinking. And he had his speech ready, and here he comes. But check out what happens. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran. Okay, now we're talking about running events. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. First, I'm stunned by the fact that when he saw him a long way off, he wasn't filled with contempt for his son, rather with compassion. And when God sees you today, wherever you are in your state of life, he doesn't have contempt for you. He has compassion for you. It doesn't mean that consequences aren't real. It doesn't mean that God's happy about the choices that you made. It just means that he sees how miserable you are. He knows how much it hurts. He knows how devastating the consequences have been. And he's looking at you going, man, everything is a mess. And my heart bleeds for you. I have compassion on your situation right now, such that it is going to prompt me right now to start running towards you. We know in this first parable that one of the hundred sheep get stuck in a briar, right? So the odds aren't that terrible. It's just one out of a hundred. But we know Jesus is the good shepherd, so he moves to find the sheep. In the second case, we know a lady had 10 coins, but she lost one in the house. The odds are higher. Now we're one out of 10. So she turns the furniture over. We know that's God Almighty searching the house until he finds that is lost. But now we've got a father with two sons. So the stakes are moving up now. Not one out of a hundred, not one out of 10. Now it's one out of two. And this father represents our heavenly father, God Almighty, God who created the cosmos. And now we understand that God is running. And this is the craziest thing Jesus could have said. Because when you look through the eyes and the lens of someone living in the Middle Eastern Palestinian world in the time of Jesus, no patriarch in the position of this father would ever run in public. You say, well, why not? What was the big deal? Because to run in public, he would pull his robe up and tuck it into his belt. And to do that, he would expose his legs. And that was disrespectful in this culture and would never happen. It would disgrace the father and be an embarrassment to the entire village. But this father said, I couldn't care less what the village thinks today. They're going to see my ankles and my shins and my knees and some of my thighs today because I'm running toward my boy today. I see him a long way off and I'm coming down the road and I am going to turn into the father who ran. So we now have in view the greatest running event in the history of humanity. And you think, well, that's so great that the father ran. But that, that might be because you see the dad living at the end of a long lane, right? Is that kind of the way you saw it? It's a long driveway that comes down to the house with the porch and dad's on the porch and there's a gate to the driveway way down there. And when the son kind of comes through the gate, the dad gets up off the porch and runs down the driveway, right? That'd be a very Western way to see this story. But in the days of Jesus, people lived in community. So there's a village involved. There's a community reputation at stake. And as I dug more and more and more into this text, I discovered there's something in play here called Keza. Jesus doesn't explicitly mention it in the story, 
but it would be in the background of the mind of a listener seeing this through Palestinian eyes. Dr. Kenneth Bailey, who is a New Testament scholar and has written extensively on seeing the gospels and the teachings of Jesus through the eyes of people who would have lived in the culture in which he lived. He writes about how in the Talmud, the Jewish law, dating all the way back to the days of Moses, there was a ceremony called Keza. That ceremony would happen if a Jewish boy married someone that the family didn't approve of, or if a Jewish boy lost his inheritance to a Gentile. Were that to happen, and the boy were to decide at any point that he wanted to return back home, he would have to come to the village and face the Keza ceremony at the gates of the village. The ceremony would be led by the elders of the village and the father of the boy was not allowed to attend. The reason why is because in this culture, a father's blessing trumped community decisions. And so the father was required to remain in the house. The mother could come and plead for the mercy of her boy, but not the dad. The elders of the city would hear out the boy, decide his fate, and if they decided Keza was coming, a word which means cut off, they would throw a clay pot at the foot of the son, smash it on the ground, and say to him, you are now Keza. You are cut off from our community and our village forever. And this son knew that not only did he have to face his dad, before that he had to face Keza. And his only shot at Keza was a plan to work enough for my dad to get enough money to pay back the debt. I know I'm never getting back in the house, but I'll work as hard as I can to pay back the debt if you'll let me back in the village. And knowing that the father was watching the road. The boy had decided to come back. News had traveled up the grapevine and the dad had gotten word, your kid is coming home. We don't know how long the journey took. He was in a far country, two weeks, one week, eight days. The dad was watching the road. Why? Because the dad had to get to his boy before his dad, his boy, got to Keza. The only chance that the dad had to put his arms around the boy was to get to him before he got to the gates of the village. And when he saw him a long way off, he tucked up his robe and started to sprint. He said, I don't care about what anybody thinks about me today. I just want my boy to know what I think about him today. And he finds him down the road, throws his arms around his son. He kisses his son. He shouts and proclaims, this is my boy. He was dead, but he is alive. Put a robe, the best robe on his back, put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet. This is my son. He was lost, but now he's found. He was dead, but now he is alive and on the road. In that moment, reconciliation happened and it trumped Keza, so that when they returned together and came to the gates of the village, the boy already had the robe of his father's family. He had the ring of his dad's authority. He had the shoes that elevated him in the culture of the day. And he had his dad's arm around his shoulder. And they just walked right through the city gates and right past Keza and right to the house. And they had a party for that boy that night. He didn't get Keza. He got 
God's great dance floor. How? You're like, this whole gospel is too easy. That's not what's going to happen to my kid if he decides to come home. There's going to be some payback in our family. We got a black sheep right now. I got some work to do. This is not God saying there are no consequences. This is God announcing something called grace. And when you fast forward to Good Friday, you now see and understand when Jesus hung on the cross, he got Keza. He literally got cut off. So much that he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God Almighty smashed the pot of our sins at the foot of the cross of his son and said, you're cut off so that all of us in this place today could get the open arms of the Father in an embrace and welcome home. He got Keza. And we got grace. And that father said, kill the fatted calf. If you're not a rancher and you buy your meat at Publix, that doesn't add up to you. But in the culture of Jesus' day, when you were anticipating a great celebration, you started fattening up one of the cows. Get it ready, because we're having a party on November the 9th. Fatten him up. Nope, more, 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 more. So that when it's celebration time, you don't go, oh my gosh, do we have, do we have what we need? And you go, oh no, we've already got a fatty calf right here because we were expecting a party. Hello? God is the first mover in your story. So that on the day that you decide you want to come home, on the day that you decide you need forgiveness, on the day that you recognize that you need a savior, you're not going to catch God off guard. He's not going to throw an impromptu party. He's not going to see what they got in the cupboard and see if they can, you know, get, uh, uh, get something put together real quick. He's going to say, I, I already anticipated your return. This father, when he saw the boy, he was like, I knew my boy was coming back. I expected my boy would come home. I've been praying that my boy would see the light and I've been fattening up a calf the whole time. And as soon as I knew he was coming, we started doing double fattening so that the day that he did come over the hill. I already had a calf ready for the celebration. Therefore, when we read in Revelation 13 that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, we understand that when you got ready to see God who was already looking at you, he said, don't you worry. I've been fattening up my son for the entire history of eternity so that he could be a sacrifice slain for you, that on the day that you turn toward home, your sin was already atoned for and you are already forgiven. Right now, the price has been paid. Right now, everything has been done. Right now, a party can be thrown in this moment. He got Keza. You get welcome home. And I'll tell you in the simplest way I can why that's good news. Because you were created by God and your life will terminate at your creator. And the scripture says, it doesn't matter what the culture has told you, the scripture is telling you today, it is appointed 
for man once to die and then the judgment. You're like, when I die, I'm going to the pearly gates. Oh, where did you hear that? I've been looking for it. And we've all got a pearly gates joke story in our repertoire. A Georgia fan and a Georgia Tech fan arrived at the pearly gates together. And Peter, no. At the end of your life, you are going to appear at the judgment seat of God. And you are going to give an account for your life. And if you're thinking it's going to be some kind of Pharaoh speech, like you're thinking you're going to quote Pharaoh when you get there, I, I, I know, I know I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I did a lot of bad things and didn't get it all right. And I know I didn't always listen when you were trying to help me and I always didn't do it your way. And I know sometimes I made a few mistakes here and there, but blah, blah, blah. You think that's what's gonna work? When you arrive at the judgment seat of Christ? He's holy. And that's why he had to run when you are a long way off and get to you before you got to the gates. So that when you got to the gates, you had his robe on your back and God's ring on your finger and the shoes of the gospel of peace on your feet and his arm around your shoulder so that you could walk into the gates of the eternal village of God, already covered by the Father's blessing, because the Father's blessing trumps Keza every single time. Praise be to God for his incredible grace today. Wow. Oh, what a savior. Isn't he wonderful? So I just invite you, we're gonna bow our heads together, close our eyes, and it's just gonna give you that moment of privacy. If there's anyone in this house today that says, I am finished with doing it my way, And today my eyes are wide open. My vision is 2020. He sees you. And he doesn't have contempt for you. Rather, his heart is filled with compassion. You say, but I wrecked it all. He knows, that's why he has compassion on you. He sees all the wreckage. So if you wanna be saved today, just tell him. Dear God, just tell him. Dear God, I'm asking you to save my life today. Thank you, Jesus, that you got cut off in death for me so that I could get forgiveness and be welcomed home. Just tell him I need it. I asked for it. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. 
And I thank you that you're a God of grace. I believe it and I receive it in Jesus' name.